If your story is boring, it is your villain's fault. The golden rule across all storytelling mediums is as follows. Do not waste your audience's time. This is because time and attention are limited and precious. So if you are wasting their time, they will become bored and find something else to do or watch instead, and likely not return. So how should we improve our storytelling skills as to not bore our audience? Hi, I'm Woody. Welcome to the Woodland Fellowship. This is a channel where storytelling and adventure gaming meet. Now, this video may be helpful for storytellers of all kinds, but we're going to be focusing primarily through the lens as game masters of tabletop role-playing games like Dungeons & Dragons and Pathfinder. Now, let's begin by identifying what makes a story, or game in this case, boring in the first place, uh, so that way we can find some ways to fix them. Now, the reason why an audience might become bored uh, or dissatisfied uh, can be pretty varied and complex, and that is because there's two main elements of storytelling. You have the story itself, but then you also have the telling. Now, what I mean by the story is the overall structure of the narrative. Uh, that's going to be composed of the events of the plot and the characters and the setting details that all contribute and generate those plot uh, events. That's the story. Those are the, the pieces that, that are being told. Then you have the telling. That is how that information is actually conveyed to your audience or to your players. Uh, and so that could be things like specific word choice or uh, descriptions, the energy in how you deliver uh, those words uh, accordingly. Uh, that can be visual aesthetics or musical accompaniment, uh, and just the overall experience of the audience. That is contributing to the telling. So either a poorly crafted story, a poorly told story, or both can lead to bored players. Now, there are a lot of resources out there uh, that exist to improve the quality of the telling, um, and those tend to be geared specifically for individual uh, media, such as uh, movies, TV, books and novels, that sort of thing. And many of those resources are still going to be useful for us as game masters too. Uh, so however, instead of focusing primarily on the telling today, we're going to be focusing on improving the essence of the story itself, which is really the foundation of everything else. And that will help improve uh, and, and help you avoid a lot of problems that might come in addition to telling issues as well. So if your story is boring, why is that? And how do we fix it? It comes down to a single word, conflict. Many problems with storytelling occur because of problems with how a story's conflict has been created, how it's managed or resolved. So there are three really common issues with conflict that will make your story boring. The first one is that you just don't have enough conflict or you don't have enough challenges uh, to be solved. There's just nothing to do. There's nothing to fix. Um, how many times have you uh, been talking with players in a uh, tabletop role-playing game like Dungeons & Dragons, uh, maybe talking about a session that maybe a player missed, and the description was, well, nothing really happened. Maybe you said those words yourself. Oof. That doesn't guarantee that, that it was a boring session, um, but especially if you have several themes where that tends to be the idea, a lot, I guarantee your players are sometimes questioning whether or not uh, that it is the best use of their time, right? Because nothing is really happening, especially in a game like Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, their character abilities are designed for things like combat, and if you don't have combat in that game, you should probably be playing a different game instead, more, more specifically. Uh, maybe you aren't sure if that is what your players are, are thinking. So a good series of indicators would be... Um, do your players, or are there players, maybe including you, who are watching videos or playing games on their phone or sharing memes with one another while active play is happening? That indicates that they don't feel like they have anything to do, so they're trying to uh, 
use up their time and attention on some things. That way they aren't becoming, hopefully, overly distracting uh, to others who are engaged, right? But that tells you that it might be boring for them because they have nothing to do with that particular game. Uh, common areas in D&D &D that tend to uh, indicate boring uh, elements uh, would be travel travel montages, and sometimes in combat, where you might take two minutes for your turn, and then you sit for 45 minutes before you get another turn, and you have nothing to do in between, right? Um, could it be that uh, you are doing a bunch of info dumps, right, where the players are just being given information, uh, but they don't really have an option or ability to react to it, nothing to take and run with it, right? Uh, Players that don't feel like they have anything to contribute or do uh, will oftentimes feel like they just came over to watch other people play the game or just, I came over here to sit and listen to GM talk for a couple hours and I didn't really do anything, right? That isn't fun. That is actually rather boring. And so if this is one of the main problems that you find as you're analyzing your story um, and your game in general, that means you don't have enough conflict, so add some. Add some conflict. Uh, having an enemy attack is a common trope that happens in a lot of fantasy games, but it's a trope that works because, especially if you have this long, drawn-out ar uh, ar argument about not knowing what to do next or nothing's really happening, make something happen. Give them something to react to. Give them something to resolve and try and fix. Now, just adding conflict for the sake of conflict is not necessarily the best thing either. So in addition to adding conflicts, you should also be adding the right kinds of conflict because wrong kinds of conflict will also make the game and the story boring. Um, so, for example, this particular cause, cause number two, is rather subjective. Uh, it's going to be determined specifically by the expectations of your audience. Uh, so what may be boring for one particular group may be perfect for another one. So this is why it's really, really important to talk through and set expectations early on and throughout as you play uh, in your RPG campaign. So that's why, for example, a session zero is really important. That's why uh, setting those expectations is key, even in other types of storytelling, whether it be movies and TV shows, through marketing, through genre expectations, uh, maybe previous experiences in this sort of game or this sort of story. All of that contributes to what they are expecting and the types of problems they're hoping to be encountering and solving. Now, if this, number two, is your source of boring, um, that probably means that you are putting too much focus on the wrong kinds of conflict, or you're not putting enough focus on the right kinds of conflict. Now, I keep mentioning kinds of conflict. What do I mean by that? So if we think in just general categories, we have physical, mental, and social conflicts. This is the way that you are being challenged and that you need to overcome. Now, physical conflicts very commonly are going to be things like combat, because you're going to physically hit somebody with a sword, for example. Uh, but that can also include uh, things like environmental hazards or obstacles that you need to uh, act quickly to dodge out of the way, like traps, or uh, maybe you need to physically lift something heavy out of the way, or you need to work together to overcome uh, a particular physical barrier. Mental conflicts, uh, this is more mental within your players, not necessarily within the characters themselves, but it definitely translates. So, for example, a mental conflict would be mysteries and secrets that are uh, starting to come about. Maybe you have some clues and just the fact that a player doesn't know something that could be known, that creates a little bit of a, a built-in conflict in terms of, ooh, how do we handle that? Or maybe there is discrepancy in some of those details that are coming out. And if they catch it, that makes them go, wait, something isn't quite right, right? That is where, uh, where those sorts of things can come from. In terms of your dungeon design, for example, are you using things like riddles and puzzles in order to get past a particular room or encounter? If you're doing heists, it is, by definition, trying to solve a puzzle of what is the best way to go about um, infiltrating this particular installation that might have the items or, or people that you're looking to rescue or things like that, uh, trying to time 
uh, routes with guards and stuff like that. Like that would count as a form of a mental conflict, something that they have to think hard about. Uh, this could also just be referring to the overall complexity of the challenges that are being presented. So that could be referring to physical conflicts as well uh, when it comes to like tactics. If your enemies aren't really using tactics and so it makes the combat kind of boring, that's kind of tying into your mental conflicts in that it's just not complex enough uh, to actually keep uh, some players' attention that way. So that could be part of it. Social conflicts. Uh, that is, of course, going to be referring to potential conflicts between individuals. And a lot of times uh, you will see uh, uh, GMs and authors really focus heavy on the romantic side of that part of a conflict or, or other risking of social status or standing. Um, and, and that is totally fine. Some players really like it, but just be careful because some players really don't. That's not their, their cup of tea, as it, as it were, um, and because that can come across as uh, melodramatic, right? Where where the drama or the emotion feels exaggerated compared to what an appropriate level should be given that particular situation, uh, right? And so again, that's where choosing the right kind of conflicts is really important uh, for your particular group. Other ways that you can do a social conflict besides the romantic side uh, could be more on the political intrigue and questioning motivations aspect of things, right? Maybe you have rival factions are vying for influence and uh, and they're trying to gather information from the the player characters and so the players are trying to resist that trying to identify which uh, characters which NPCs are trustworthy which ones are not um, that can also create dilemmas right where maybe you have split alliances and those factions might be at odds with one another and depending on what the players choose, they're going to lose favor with one or more of uh, their allies, their friends and family, right? So creating those sorts of dilemmas really, really heightens your social conflicts accordingly. Now, you probably noticed that even in some of my descriptions, there's some overlap, right? A lot of times social conflicts, if it goes really poorly, uh, becomes a physical conflict. Or depending on how those physical conflicts come about, that can affect mental conflicts and so on, right? There's a lot of overlapping, so I strongly recommend don't have just one kind of conflict when it comes to injecting uh, conflicts into a particular scene or story. Um, you do want to overlap it a bit, but just be careful that you're not overdoing it. Uh, but if your story is boring, it's probably not because you're overdoing it. You're probably under underdoing it. And that leads actually to the third point here, and that is that the tension and the stakes in the story are too low. And maybe it's that the, the players have the sense that it's almost guaranteed, or even if they do or don't do a particular thing, uh, that the result is still the same, right? Then in that case, it there is no tension there. Um, so a lot of things that can contribute to that sense are on one side where your villains might be incompetent, they might be tame, uh, they might not be threatening, and not even in a comical way. It's just they are clearly there to slow the players down, uh, and not even in an interesting way. It's just they're there just to be an obstacle, and, and that isn't very, very effective, right? That, again, goes back to our golden rule. Don't waste our audience's time. Right? We want it to be uh, meaningful in, in each of those particular interactions. Um, so, yeah, your villains might be too weak. That might be part of the reason why your tension and your stakes are too low. The inverse is also possibly true to contribute to that, where your heroes are too overpowered or they have little to no weaknesses. This is why uh, in recent you know, years when it comes to a lot of common movies, uh, the accusation of character creation, um, characters being too overpowered, not having weaknesses, not needing to take time uh, to, to learn how to be better and so on. That's where that idea of a Mary Sue or a Gary Stu character comes from. And the reason why that's dangerous is that because of this piece right here, when you have uh, heroes that don't have a potential weakness, uh, that really can sap and drain the tension and lower the stakes in the story where it just feels like, eh, it's not that interesting. And that's why, for example, writers have had such a hard time um, over the years and they needed to inject conflicts like this uh, in writing characters like Superman. 
that originally there was no such thing as kryptonite. It was just Superman and he was very powerful. But until they started injecting uh, weaknesses to be able to raise the stakes, it was actually kind of boring for, for a lot of for a lot of people. Uh, and that becomes just the challenge as a writer and an author and a game master, just be mindful of the power level and the overall challenge uh, that you are uh, providing into, into a particular story. Beyond just the, the issue of risk, maybe the low risk is a big reason why your tension or, or stakes are too low. How do we fix it? Well, the first thing is identify what are the consequences if the heroes fail. So if they don't do the thing, or if they ignore it and do something else, what happens? You identify what is the scope? Who does that failure affect? Does it just affect one person? Does it affect the players? Does it affect a small village or a whole kingdom? Who does that affect? And so if you're going to increase the tension and stakes, increase that scope. That's a good way to do it. So if it's only affecting one person, make it affect a whole town. If it's affecting a whole town, make it affect a whole city. If it's affecting a whole city, make it affect a whole region or a district or and so on. That's one way. The other way is to increase the magnitude of that failure, right? How does it affect individuals when they uh, when the heroes are failing to do this particular thing? So if you're increasing the magnitude, that would be, well, very commonly, for example, in combat, that tends to be fighting to the death, right? And that's a pretty significant um, uh, consequence to the combat. But when we're thinking about other things, right, why are they fighting? What are they hoping to achieve there? So let's say, for example, it's more than a question of simply a captured person might get murdered, which is pretty terrible. How would we increase the stakes? Well, let's say that uh, it's an evil cultist or a group of cultists have been abducting people in order to murder them as a part of some dark ritual. And so what is that ritual going to do? I don't know. Maybe it's going to summon just this evil demon lord or or it's going to uh, spread a pestilence. And I don't know, but you're adding the magnitude. You're adding and increasing what the effect is going to be if the heroes fail to succeed in stopping the bad guys in doing whatever that, that might be, right? So if that is the source of what is making your particular story or game boring, definitely find ways to identify and increase the scope and magnitude of those particular conflicts so that that will increase that, uh, that sense there. Another way is to shorten the window of time that the heroes have in order to try and stop the bad thing from happening. Because if they have an infinite amount of time, uh, then they're going to take all that time to prepare and be the best they possibly can be. And again, it lowers that tension, it lowers that stakes, right? It also lowers the risk or the perceived risk of failure, right? All of that kind of uh, contributes accordingly. So shorten that window. Uh, maybe instead of giving them a month, give them a week. Or instead of a week, give them a day or an hour. Um, and, and that way you can work it out that way accordingly. So those are the three main areas uh, for why a story, whether in a game in this particular sense or in other media, uh, would become boring. And it could be any and all of these in any combination that contributes to that story being boring. Now, the reason why we go through this is because, yes, this is how we can fix something that is currently boring. But is there a way to avoid the boring stories altogether? Yes, boring stories are indeed avoidable. So you can generate the proper amount of conflict, you can generate the right kinds of conflict, and the right stakes for conflicts by creating, developing, and utilizing your villains properly. I said it at the beginning that if your story is boring, it is your villain's fault. And that is because antagonists generally and villains specifically are the engines for story conflict. So boring stories derive primarily from ineffective villains. And the difference between an effective villain and an ineffective villain is simply in their ability to to be compelling to the heroes and to the audience. Now, how then should we make a villain compelling? And so let's define some things here because compelling does not necessarily mean sympathetic or emotionally stirring. 
sometimes that's what we mean specifically on the effect on the audience, a compelling story. Um, but when it comes to a villain being compelling, it's basically they are compelling the heroes into action, right? That the villain's actions and choices force the heroes to react, very much like the pull of a magnet, where if you have a compelling villain and your heroes are not reacting to them, it is because they must actively be resisting that call to action, and that creates some more of that social conflict. And that's one of the main reasons why, for example, in The Hero's Journey, one of those points that is often undertaken is the refusal of the call, and then while that hero is feeling that pressure, that, that social conflict of that pull of what they should be doing that they're not, eventually it calls them into action that they need to step up to do the right thing, whatever that that story is calling for in that sense. So how do we then make a compelling villain that does that, right? That's really the, the thing. We want to create these villains that have that magnetic pull for the hero's choices. So the first thing you do is identify the the who, right? Who are your villains? And then specifically, you narrow down what do they want? Why do they want it? And how are they going to get it? So let's break each of those down individually. So the what, what is it that they want? Now, this what that you're choosing for these villains, this what is ultimately what the heroes are going to be trying to stop from happening. So I strongly recommend that you use really strong verbs and you can simplify it something, right? If you're just going to use a handful of words, what are the, what is it that your villains want? Do they want to build something? Do they want to kill? Oh, it says kill something, but it could also be kill someone. Uh, you could destroy something. You could steal something. They could seduce someone and so on that they are just trying to do something. Now, how do you know what you should choose? Like, what is a good what for a villain to want? So a compelling villain will challenge and threaten a core belief, a, a, a core activity or value that the heroes have, uh, specifically in what they're trying to achieve. And so what the villain wants should threaten what the heroes care about. So pick a good what. Uh, because that is going to really be that first domino in making sure that your villains are compelling to your players. Now, this also means, right, because it's tied directly to your heroes, right, what is it that they want? That means that not every villain is really going to be effective uh, as being compelling to any hero, right? They're going to be uh, specific to what those heroes are looking for. So during character creation, uh, when I am a game master, I have my players answer three questions about their characters. Number one, what is something that will consistently make your character angry? Number two, what is a secret that your character knows and wants to protect? And number three, what is an item that they own that has deep sentimental value? Now, the player can certainly add even more details to the backstory, of course, but ultimately I want the answer to those things in particular uh, because that tells me about what they care about. And then I can craft villains in order to threaten those things, right? Because that helps me identify uh, what the villain should want that will challenge those particular heroes. So we talked about what they want. So let's move to the next question, right? So if we choose a compelling what, now we need a compelling why. Why do these villains want that particular thing, right? And this why establishes um, their passion and level of urgency to pursue their goal there. So there's a lot of examples of, of reasons why, right? And what is the motivation? So for example, revenge, that's a really common one. Uh, maybe protection of a loved one. This, uh, a great example of that would be Mr. Freeze from Batman, right? He has a twisted uh, mentality on that, but that's a great example. Uh, maybe they are trying to further a cause that they see as just. Maybe it is a just cause, but they're going about it the wrong way. Or maybe it's they're believing lies about it and it's 
not actually just, or they have misplaced values, but they are a true believer in it. That could be a thing. Uh, maybe they're trying to earn the approval of a, of a particular someone. Usually, you see very commonly um, uh, parents or love interests are that someone that the villain is trying to earn favor and approval from. Uh, or maybe uh, they're a villain, they're already in power, and they just want to maintain the status quo. So they are looking to pursue their what in a way that will let them eliminate threats. Right, that could be a common thing. And there's a whole host of, of, of whys a villain might possibly have. Now, I said this at the beginning, but I want to uh, repeat this here. When we're talking about a compelling villain, we usually run into a trope with, with villains in, in modern storytelling um, where, where villains are made sympathetic or trying to generate a sense of sympathy within characters or within the audience. Now, this is usually why we see that a villain would have um, really just an awful backstory, right? Showing um, maybe a horrendous childhood or, or just an overall awful environment that has shaped the villain to become what they are at that time. Now, building sympathy for a villain can be effective, but only in one particular instance, and that is when the hero's desired uh, resolution for the conflict is reconciliation or redemption or a conversion of the villain to their side, where they are calling out uh, to the potential good that still might be within the villain. That is why, for example, that sort of a focus works with uh, Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader, because that's what Luke is wanting for Vader. But doing something similar like that with the Emperor it would just fall flat. And that's really where where the risk of trying to build sympathy for villains can really come into play. Um, because most villains likely should not be sympathetic. Because if it's done in the wrong way or it's the wrong matching and pairing, um, building sympathy will muddy and possibly ruin the overall story. Um, it can derail the story's themes and, and derail your tension, right? It makes the, the villains less threatening in that sense, um, right? And that will lead to more of like your wrong kinds of conflict, lowering the stakes that we talked about before as well. So, so if you are going to be building that sympathy for your villains, be very, very cautious uh, and make sure that you are in very intentional with a lot of those things, right, when you do that. So we talked about the what, we talked about the why. So how, how are they going to get it? So this is really, really important for game masters to understand these specific things, uh, because this helps us know how to adapt the story as players make choices. Uh, so that way you know what the next step would look like, because we know what the villain still wants. We know why they want it. And a good way to think of this question is rewording it to think of, well, what does the villain need in order to accomplish that particular goal, right? So for example, maybe they need people and maybe they need different kinds of people. Maybe they need workers. So maybe they'll recruit them uh, and hire them, or maybe they kidnap them and force them to work. Or maybe they need specialists, uh, individuals who have a particular set of skills and knowledge that not everyone has. And, and so that could be maybe they need uh, medical doctors, maybe they need special inventors, just thinking of individuals who are very good at a particular thing, right? Maybe those are the kinds of people the villain needs in order to accomplish their goal. Um, maybe the villain is trying to build an army, so they just need soldiers, right? So thinking like that, maybe they need people. Okay, maybe they need resources. So sticking with the army building idea, uh, maybe they need money, money to pay for uh, for their army. That's what they're going to be doing. Or uh, maybe they need weapons and ammunition to be able to actually arm their uh, their their army. Or maybe they need uh, unique materials, uh, maybe a type of fuel, or it is a a, a special a series of items that they need for like a dark ritual or something. Okay. Uh, and then maybe they need locations, uh, something specific, such as maybe a ruined temple that they need to, to go there to be able to achieve uh, a very specific effect. Or maybe they are looking to acquire a fortress that can be a strong um, headquarters for them uh, to then send out their, their sorties of, of, 
uh, scouts and uh, raiders and things like that. Maybe that is, is the key there. Or maybe they need time in order to achieve what they're looking for. Uh, so that will uh, likely indicate that they are going to be uh, creating diversions or causing other delays. Uh, maybe they need a specific date or specific time of year in order for their plan to come to fruition. And so they need to create uh, choices based on that. Now you'll notice that each of these elements, depending on how you answer this question in terms of people, resources, locations, and time, each one of these can make a really good quest for your heroes to interact with the villain's plan. Right, so let's take resources. If the villain needs money, that can explain why uh, the villain is using banditry to acquire and steal money or robbing banks or things like that. Uh, right, that, that helps narrow down some of those specific things that, uh, that the adventurers would be able to undertake and try and solve on a, on a small level. And with each of those interactions could start slowly revealing uh, larger elements of your villain's plan. Uh, so here's the reason why it's also in addition to that. So if the heroes stop the villain in one of those areas, which they're likely going to do, so if they're going to take out the bandits, for example, what would the villain pursue next? Well, because we've identified what they need, okay, what would the villain do as an alternative? And maybe they're doing that off screen, as it were, whereas the heroes are continuing other things, the villain might be causing other trouble elsewhere as the alternative. Or maybe there is multiple quest options that the players uh, had available and they chose something else. So because the heroes didn't interrupt uh, the villain's plans, okay, now that they succeeded in this, what is the next step that the villain is going to pursue? How would that situation make it worse for the heroes the next time that they have that opportunity to interact with the villain's master plan and scheme? So as you can see, as you get specific on this, uh, the more specific, the better, because that will really help you as the GM uh, be able to pick and identify those types of problems uh, that you can throw the, the player's way and go from there. Now, here is then the secret sauce for uh, creating your compelling um, uh, villains, ultimately, right? So we talked about what, why, and how. Here's the secret. Because villains are your engine for conflict and having the appropriate amount of conflict, the right kinds of conflict, and the right tension for conflicts, don't just have one villain. Have multiple of these engines to create these particular situations for the players uh, to navigate in the world, right? So each of these villains that you make, give each of them different what's, why's, and how's for what they are trying to achieve, and then have each of those threaten uh, simultaneously various different levels and scopes of society. Uh, so you can, for example, sticking with the bandit idea, maybe you have a bandit leader uh, that is threatening a small village. Or maybe you have a corrupt politician within a city, uh, maybe just affecting the larger county, and they're seeking different ways to uh, garner more power. And, and what does that look like? Um, maybe you have a, um, a secret assassin that's killing prominent members within the society, or you have a cultist kidnapping people for a dark ritual and so on. You could have all of these all affecting different areas of the society at large. And depending on which ones the players choose to interact with, that will help shape and guide where the overall story is going to go, which villains are completely stopped, which villains get away, right? All of that can really, really work well. So I recommend having and maintaining between three and five villains um, in various levels and different power struggles and so on um, to be able to consistently generate lots of different ideas for different kinds of conflicts. And you'll notice that even some of your villains might be at odds with other villains. Uh, so not all of them have to be interconnected or all working together. Um, it could be very, very interesting if they are, but also is more interesting and probably more realistic if they're not. Uh, and that can 
again, modify your tension and stakes uh, accordingly. And so my next video is actually going to go much more deeper into this, uh, this similar point. Uh, to be able to generate new ideas for villains uh, and side quests and other types of obstacles to overcome to really wrestle with and, and give you guys tools uh, to really maximize your your storytelling capability at the table uh, for your tabletop role-playing games. So, to conclude, boring stories come from weak, uncompelling villains who do not challenge the heroes in a way that forces them to react. So we create these compelling villains by clearly determining what these villains want, why they want it, and how they are hoping to get it, and doing so in a way that creates enough conflicts of the right kinds with increasing pressure and tension as the story plays itself out to the ultimate conclusion and resolution of the story. So if your story is boring, it is your villain's fault. So fix it. See you guys next time.